Um, I'm going to begin, uh, Paul, by asking, I mean, Dog Eat Dog marks something quite uh, remarkable, which is your acting debut. <laughs> I was just wondering, after all these years, what made you think, yeah, well, I'll have a go at that? Well, I, I certainly didn't want to. Um, God knows I tried to get other people. I uh, wanted Tarantino to do it. I wanted Abel Ferrara to do it. I even talked to Rupert Everett about doing it as a transgender Cleveland gangster, and he was up for it, but then uh, the Oscar Wilde thing got in the way. And... Uh, and I, uh, you know, Nick kept saying, you, well, you should just do it. And, uh, and then by the time we got to that scene, which was toward the end of the schedule, we were running so low on money that I was the only one left that we could afford. So I, I did it. But, you know, ironically, I had never done it before because I always felt that I would see myself and not like myself and cut myself out of the movie. And I didn't want to take that chance because... I remember on Taxi Driver, an actor got injured, and I said to Scorsese, I said, what are you going to do about that character? And he said, oh, I thought I'd play him myself. I said, Marty, Marty, please don't play him yourself, because I was convinced that he would see himself and cut himself out of the movie, and it wasn't an essential scene. The whole scene could be cut out. And, um, but I was wrong. Because the opposite thing happened. He saw himself, he loved himself, and made it as long as he possibly could. And uh, so, uh, but, uh, you know, but now finally I just, you know, have gotten so old, I really don't give a fuck. And um, obviously you just mentioned that it was Tarantino, Abel Ferrara, and even um, uh, Scorsese that you asked to play this. So why did you specifically ask like, directors for that particular part? Uh, because they work cheap. Yeah. <laughs> That's fair enough. Um, and this is obviously wildly different from the Edward Bunker novel. Was that more of a, an inspiration than a, is, rather than this being considered kind of straight adaptation? Yeah, it's not that faithful. Uh, I felt the challenge was, you know, Ed, Ed Bunker had a sort of 70s uh, sensibility. The book was set in the 90s. And I was trying to figure out how do you make a crime film for right now, 2016 after Scorsese and Tarantino and Guy Ritchie. And so if I had been more faithful to Ed Bunker, it wouldn't have felt as immediate as I wanted it to feel. So in fact, it's not the most faithful adaption. And adaptation, rather. And I get a sense some filmmakers often try and kind of, um, they feel obliged to get into the head of someone who's a bit unhinged and understand what makes them tick. But this film feels more like a kind of unapologetic depiction of just three mad bastards, basically. Is, I mean, was that the, I mean, there were people like that. Is that the aim just to go, we don't have to understand them to know that they're just a no, bit crazy? No, no, I mean, you don't. I mean, what, what's nice about Cage and Defoe, and they both have this kind of charisma, which is they can play characters who you really do not like, but you love watching them play those characters. So you can say, you know, uh, you know Willem, you know, this guy is the worst person ever, but gee, I like w watching Willem play that. And so that, uh, you know, and, th and that's really just the, the gift of uh, well, certain actors, you know, who can pull that off. And you've obviously mentioned there was a sort of limited budget on this, but do you actually think when you're working with limited resources, it actually brings out more creativity from the filmmaker because you've got no choice but to be resourceful? Yeah, I mean, you have no choice but to be bold. If you, uh, if you get scared, uh, then you're doomed. And so you just use the fact that you're shooting in, uh, 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 on a tight schedule just to go the other way, it's just to be free. And, and, and never look back. I mean, one of my thoughts in making the film was to try to get ahead of the audience, which we do in that opening sequence, and then just take off and, and never let the viewer know where you're going next. Uh, and if your viewer thinks you might turn right, then turn left. And, uh, and I, I, you know, for people who haven't heard about the film before, I sort of challenge them to guess where it's going because it is like a jazz riff in that way. It just sort of, oh, let's go here, let's do that, let's do that. Do you find that you can be almost inspired by your own protagonists? Because obviously they're so unpredictable. Do you think that kind of rubs off on you and it gives you more license to be a bit kind of different, I guess, with the, with the edit particularly? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, uh, and, and also the fact that uh, 
you know, part and parcel of this situation was that I had final cut, and I just I felt absolutely free to do whatever I wanted. And I mean, you've worked of course with uh, Nicholas and William countless times before. It must make it so much easier when you first arrive on set. You must already have this kind of shorthand between you that's already been established. Uh, yes and no. I mean, you know, people talk about improvisation in films, but there isn't that much improvisation in films. Where there is improvisation is in the rehearsal process, and that's where you really play around. And you, you know, uh, and. Uh, so, like, the funniest line in the movie was in rehearsals. And, you know, and Nick Cage says, you know, what, what's that thing you, you know, uh, you put in the baby's mouth? And Willem in rehearsals says, you mean a dick? And all of a sudden Willem goes, oh, I shouldn't have said that, that's terrible. <laughs> but we were all laughing and said, no, that's funny. <laughs> so we left it in. Because, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, William is completely nuts in this movie. Did you give him free reign to be as crazy as he liked? Or was he still kind of uh, adhering quite strictly to the, to the screenplay? Uh, quite, you know, pretty much to the screenplay, yeah. yeah. And, and as for Nicolas Cage, I mean, he plays unhinged like nobody else really. He's got, he almost seems he's got this vacancy where he sometimes not, it feels like he's not even in the room. Yeah. But at the same time, he can re represent normality. He must have been such a perfect casting for this particular role. Yeah, well, I mean, I originally offered Nick the psycho role, and he had just played a psycho in a movie. I, I think it's coming out shortly called Army of One or something. And he said, I don't want to play two psychos in a row, so I'd like to play the straight guy. So then that gave me a chance to offer Will the role. And I just loved how creatively it was put together, particularly the, the opening scene with Willem, the use of colour and kind of imagery. I was wondering what the, 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 the um, decision was to present that scene in that particular way. Well, I mean, you have to um, set the tone. It's an outrageous film, and you have to let the audience know that it is outrageous. And that if they want to laugh, they should laugh. You have to give them permission to laugh. And so you can't be subtle about it. And uh, so that's why, you know, that opening is as, as um, what's the word for it, as off the walls it is. Because, I mean, the film is outrageous and I absolutely love the movie. But you, when you make a film like this, you have to kind of appreciate it's perhaps not for everyone. Is that something you just have to kind of come to terms with? When oh, you yeah, yeah. It? Well, I mean, the nice thing about opening a film with a scene like that is, you, you know, you clear everybody out of the room who shouldn't be there. I have uh, I have some friends, couples who have seen the seen the film, you know, at, at home on TV, and the wife leaves in the first scene. <laughs> and um, uh, first reformed is up next for you. If I'm DB, is anything to yeah, go by? Yeah, yeah. Uh, Ethan Hawke and Amanda Seyfried attached. I mean, what can you tell us about that one? Well, it's about as different from Doggy Dog as a film can be. Uh, I just feel it's time for me now to make a quiet film. A meditative film, so I'm doing a different kind of film. We'll see how it turns out. I mean, your career, Korean film, is remarkable. It's been spanning over sort of 40 years. I mean, how do you think you've changed as a director in that time, if, if at all? Oh, I've gotten better. Um, I think that I, I think I used to censor myself too much. Um, I. I find, I find that I censor myself less uh, as I've gotten older, which uh, is a good thing. And, uh, and with some people, it works the other way. They get scared as they get older, but I've gotten less scared. So not giving a fuck has benefited yes. your career. <laughs> um, and I, just my last question, I was watching um, Raging Bull the other day, just by, by chance. And I mean, obviously it's a masterpiece, but that goes without saying. Do you ever just sit down and just think, I'm just going to stick on Raging Bull today, or American Gigolo, or Taxi Driver, or is that a bit weird? No, I don't go back. <laughs> I don't see them again. Uh, and um, uh, you know, fortunately, I've been able to think about the next one. You know, when you... When you look at your films again, you know, one of two things happens. Either you look at it and you say, well, that's pretty good. You know, I used to have so much talent. Whatever happened to my talent? Or you look at it and you say, well, that's, no, that's no good at all. I never had any talent. I didn't then and I don't now. So I'd say, how do you win? 
<laughs> so you're better, better off not to look at them. Uh, we'll just leave it to us instead. <laughs> well, thank you so much for your time today. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, you're watching Hey You Guys. Hey You Guys, huh? Hey you guys, is yeah. that from the Goonies? It is indeed, yeah. Nice. Yeah.